we shall discuss what systemic racism means as well as racial disparities in healthcare. Then lastly, we'll talk about what is next. This event, which is hosted by the SPDC, is part of the lecture series to mark Black History Month at Wayne State University. Black History Month is a month set aside in the US to recognize the achievement of Black people who are the minority. And who would think that having had a Black president in the past, and now we have a Black vice president, that the people of color will be accepted in our community. But the facts and statistics say otherwise. Let's take, for instance, the COVID-19 vaccination. A research carried out by the APM Research Lab shows that all of the races who had received at least their first dose, the Blacks and the Latinos are the least. And looking at the screen, you can see the chat of that where the, um, the indigenous, they have 11.6%, uh, the whites 9.1, the Asians 8.6, Blacks 4.5, and the Latinos 3.5%. The latest data that was analyzed by Kaiser Family Foundation shows that the national pattern of American, African-Americans and Hispanics receiving fewer vaccinations compared to their share of COVID-19 cases and deaths as well as that of their total population. Tracy Newman, who is the senior vice president of KFF said that both blacks and, black and uh, Latin Americans are more than twice as likely as white Americans to die from complications of COVID-19 at every age. And black people are dying from COVID at roughly the same rate as the white people more than a decade older. Amongst us here today, we have two distinguished speakers, Ms. Karen Poliki and Dr. Amber Duncan. Ms. Poliki is a senior health planning and promotions consultant at Health Alliance Plan. She's also the chair of diversity and inclusion committee. Ms. Poliki, thank you for being here today. She also has a master's degree in healthcare administration from Central Michigan University. She's also a certified work site wellness program specialist and certified diversity professional through the Michigan Diversity Council. Currently, she serves as the co-chair of Henry Ford Health Systems Community Health Equity and Wellbeing Council. Ms. Poliki, can you tell us a little bit about the REACH program? Sure, good morning, everyone. Again, this is Kareen Poliki. Please feel free to address me as Kareen. I, as you heard, I'm the Senior Health Promotion Consultant at her Health Alliance Plan, excuse me. Uh, but I am not here, just to be sure, representing Health Alliance Plan. I am here uh, on behalf of the Michigan Diversity Council. And I will be speaking with you today about um, health disparities. Uh, so REACH stands for Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health. It has been a cornerstone cornerstone program through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And throughout the years that the program has been in operations, uh, it's been a grant-based program working on different areas of health, primarily within underserved communities throughout the nation. I work specifically with the Detroit um, grant program that came out of community health and social services also known as the Chaz Clinic in Southwest Detroit. The grant was specifically focused to educate community members around uh, Metro Detroit on diabetes management and education. It was all done as a partnership with U of M uh, School of Public Health and also with the use of community health workers. So I was one of the community health workers working to educate and serve as a liaison between the clinical teams at the Chaz Clinic and Henry Ford Health System and members of the community um, who became part of this program. So that's just a very small bit of outreach. Thank you. You're welcome. Us. Thank you. So our other guest is Dr. Amber Duncan. Dr. Duncan had had her undergraduate and graduate studies at Ferry State University and she received her doctor of pharmacy degree in 2015. She has been a pharmacy manager at CVS Pharmacy for almost six years, but being with, uh, she has been with CVS for almost 14 years. Dr. Duncan, 
why did you decide to go into pharmacy? Yes, hi, um, my name is Amber, Dr. Duncan. Um, I, when I was in high school, I was just kind of looking for uh, any type of job, um, but I knew I didn't want to work at like McDonald's. And so I, in one of our classes, actually CVS had as a program where they go into usually more inner city schools. So definitely see some active, um, still parts of the program in Detroit, but they go into public schools and they offer a paid internship. Um, and what you do, they do is they basically train you to be a pharmacy technician um, while also paying you for that training. And then you get uh, three months over the summer, 12 weeks of the program where you're working at least 20 hours a week, uh, basically as a pharmacy technician, some limitations to it, but that was the idea of it. Um, I knew I always wanted to do healthcare. That was just uh, where my focus was. I was very math science based student. Um, and at the time I was thinking maybe dental school, maybe med, uh, med school, but I loved pharmacy and working at CVS so much uh, in high school. And I had a really great mentor at the time uh, that encouraged me to go to Ferris and do a pharmacy degree because I, you know, naturally I just really enjoyed the job. And uh, that actually shaped my entire career and my life. Uh, that one internship that I did for 12 weeks with CVS turned into continuing working for them since I was 17. Um, it's basically the only full-time job that I've had has been in the pharmacy, uh, the pharmacy environment. And so I continued my career as a technician until I was an intern once I got into pharmacy school. And then everyone knows how that goes. You end up becoming an intern and then once you're licensed, you become a pharmacist. Um, and then I think maybe like two or three months after I became a pharmacist, they asked me to be a pharmacy manager or the, you know, pick pharmacist in charge. And um, I've been doing that ever since. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. So now I'll hand it over to Johnny to facilitate this systemic racism. Thank you, Obiama. So in order to have this conversation on systemic racism, one of the things we want to do is define what systemic racism is. And that is defined as, or sometimes referred to as structural racism, where a system of policies, legislation, rules, norms, and or customs within organizations such as companies, governmental bodies, and societal institutions enact these rules and policies specifically to the disadvantage of individuals solely on the basis of race. And to the advantage of whites as a group over these groups of color. Could you go to the next slide? So I wanna turn this question to our panelists that are here and neither one of you can chime in as to what your answer will be, but to you, what does systemic racism mean? Um, I think to me, systemic racism is basically just the entire way that our society is built, acts, reacts, forms, policies, decisions that are made um, that, again, continue to disadvantage and create a, a wealth gap or a health gap um, between races to where you're just more likely to have more money um, or be healthier individual, have a higher quality of life just based on the fact that you're white. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. Ms. Paulicki, would you like to um, chime in with an answer to that particular question? Definitely. So I would say I, I, I would agree with, with both the academic definition that was, that was put up at the very beginning and with what Dr. Duncan had just mentioned. And of course, you know, we know that these are institutionalized historical practices that are, have been in place by those of a dominant cultural group. Uh, in this case, of course, we're talking about um, the white dominant group, and it's by way of informal, informal policies, right? We know that there are laws, uh, formal policies in the books, but then I also like to talk about um, the informal policies, the ones that we don't often maybe see written, um, but that continue to live within the world that we, that, that we live in, right? Um, right. And, and those are important to, to really understand and also to acknowledge that they exist because they influence and in a way they also normalize how 
these institutions continue to remain in power and how those informal policies uh, continue to influence the outcomes that we, of course, are here today to talk about, with, which is health-related outcomes. Um, and, and in that sense, we're talking about more than just like beyond just wealth gap, we're talking about criminal justice systems and how they operate and how they differ depending who, who is being judged in a way and, and how those uh, particular um, laws are applied to different groups of people. So that's, that's what I have to add to that. Thank you. Let's, I think we can go to the next slide. So again, I, I will throw it out to both our panelists. Um, our next question is, in your role as a pharmacist or as a member of the HAP organization or even as a social worker, um, how have you seen systemic racism impact the health of minority um, patients coming and seeking care? So I can take take go first with this with this answer if that's okay, Dr. Duncan. Oh uh, yeah, or take turns. So I've had a number of different roles throughout uh, throughout my career in healthcare. I and I can uh, really speak to the way I've seen it play out in a number of different in a number of different scenarios. Um, again, I was a I worked as a community health worker, so I was embedded deeply into the Southwest Detroit community. Uh, working with both um, Hispanic and African Americans in our community. So I had a, a very uh, close opportunity to see how systemic racism, racism plays out in, in the health of these two particular groups. Uh, and, and I would say, again, going back to the idea of informal, formal policies, um, socioeconomic inequities, and that would be all around access to health care. Uh, when we think about uh, transportation as an example, uh, which is unfortunately uh, an outcome of systemic racism, very many people, if we were to focus on the city of Detroit, for example, and its surrounding suburbs, don't have access to transportation. They don't have uh, a, a personal vehicle that they can depend on. So very many times um, accessing the medical care that's needed, whether it's preventive or to take care of an acute or chronic situation, it's extremely difficult when we don't have access to transport. So I would look at that as, as transportation as being the the effect of a of systemic racist policies that have been put in place. I mean, many of you can probably um, relate or know about um, the transportation policies that were trying to be looked at from a, um, the the regional transit authority. I may not have all my um, all my. Um, the language correctly, but there was a recent, I would say in the not so recent past, we had the opportunity to vote on creating a regional transit system that really created pathways for individuals that don't have vehicles um, to move about the city. And that had, you know, we're not called a motor city for nothing. There, there is a, a history that goes into why that name exists uh, there is a history that if, if you ever get a chance to really uh, look into it, how um, we are not a pedestrian friendly um, community. Not everyone has access to purchasing a vehicle and therefore that particular, um, those particular policies that have gone into place to make our Metro Detroit area what it is, uh, really influence the health of minority groups or any groups that really don't have the socioeconomic means to have personal transport. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Duncan. Yeah, you know, I definitely can piggyback on the, the transportation, working in a pharmacy, um, drive through or people coming in, picking up their scripts, talking to patients on the phone. A thing that you hear all the time is, oh, I don't have 
a ride to get there today. I'll be there tomorrow. Um, or I'll, I'll get there sometime in the next few days. And I'm looking at the prescription and maybe it's an STD medication that needs to be treated today. Um, or maybe it's a blood pressure medication that they haven't had for three days, um, or a beta blocker, um, medication that, you know, you really shouldn't stop. You shouldn't just stop met these medications, cold Turkey. Um, and they have no way of getting it. And there's definitely even more of kind of like a mindset of kind of like, I'll get it when I get it, um, that I might not see. I, I recently moved to a Detroit store that, but I have been picking up shifts and I've always been a pharmacist willing to work in a city store. Um, and I, and I say that sentence because I think everybody here doesn't at all question what I mean when I say that, when I say I moved to a city store, that's a com that's a comment that I can make in a pharmacy setting where people understand that there's city stores and not city stores. And maybe some pharmacists, especially, you know, white pharmacists don't want to work in a city store. Why don't they want to work in a city store? Because the ethnic population is much higher than the white population. Why don't they want to work with an ethnic population? They have a preconceived mindset before they get there on how that shift is gonna go, what it's going to look like. What does it look like to work in urban Detroit? That's a sentence you can use and you can take it outside of pharmacy and you can do any public service job and say, people in general would rather work in Royal Oak in Birmingham than to work in Detroit when it comes to working with the public. Um, and unfortunately, a, I think that is a preconceived idea that's not even accurate. As someone who worked for years at 13 Mile and Woodward in Royal Oak, and then I moved and worked for two years at 13 in Southfield Road in Southfield. Um, the path that I took was predominantly white middle class in Royal Oak, go to Southfield, much higher African-American population, but still pretty well off financially. A lot of private insurance. When we're talking about pharmacy, we look at um, private insurance versus Medicaid. Uh, that is a way that we can say something professionally while saying, it's a nicer area. There's more money in the area there. You're just going to have like a little bit different class of people coming in, in terms of finance um, versus now I work at seven mile in Livernoy in Detroit. I will say uh, definitely a different change of pace, different everything. Um, but the mindset of I'm out of my blood pressure medication and I need it. The urgency in Royal Oak, much higher, much more. Well, I can't go without this. I need my medicine. I have to come get it. Whereas in Detroit, they might not come pick up a beta blocker for two weeks. Now, a beta blocker is a medication that you should taper off slowly because it affects the heart. And if you just stop it right away, there are complications to health that come with it. So for me, systemic racism and the health of minorities is at every day, hour by hour, something that I see, um, just uh, definitely a lack of urgency in terms of treating their medication with actual tablets, taking pills, um, but also the access to coming and picking up the medication. Like she said, transportation, you know, we could talk about transportation being one of the biggest things that, that impacts um, the, the racial divide and, and increases that racial gap we have in terms of access to healthcare. Because if you can't show up to the doctor's office or you can't show up to the pharmacy, that immediately impedes your, your access to healthcare. Um, and so if you have less access to healthcare, you're going to be less healthy. And that's just, you know, very, very clear cut uh, basic level of the issue. One of the biggest things being transportation, affordability, um, and just overall access to healthcare. If you think about it, um, a lot of under like served communities, predominantly African-American communities rely on Medicaid for insurance and uh, Medicaid, when you think about it, it's a health plan, access to healthcare that's decided by politicians on how much money that people get. We vote on these things. These are things that our state level politicians are voting how much money they get how much money they have to make before they qualify for Medicaid and qualify for access to healthcare. So the overall, the health of issues would be access to healthcare. And also I would say a uh, lack of um, knowledge about like nutrition, um, how the medications work, just overall a lack of knowledge on how the healthcare system works and the importance of how everything works cohesively to keep an individual healthy. Yeah, I, I'd like to add one one other thing to that. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. Um, is when we also think about uh, patient patient education materials, oftentimes 
that is also something that impacts health outcomes of, of minority populations. And oftentimes I think we as maybe native English speakers um, take for granted that everyone is going to understand the information that's in front of them. Whether that is that we're providing patient education material in, um, in, at a readability level that people can understand, it's oftentimes overlooked. We think that because we understand it, that everyone else is going to understand it. And then that only impacts the written content that we provide, but also the way we speak. So uh, it's something to, to keep in mind that oftentimes um, patient education materials are just not available in the native language that someone would prefer um, for them to understand. So if we're talking about systems, we need to look at things just like that. Materials, content, who's developing them? And are we, and are we when we are thinking of developing them, are we looking at uh, what are the preferred communication methods of individuals? right? Because we, we are not maybe thinking in that, in that sense. So I, I bring it up because it becomes part of that system when we talk about systemic racism. And how do we as individuals in positions of, of that have agency, how do we continue perpetuating that same systemic operational system um, from those different points of view? Because we can talk about transportation, we can talk about socioeconomic differences, but let's also keep in mind that there's there's language is also one of those things that we need to address. And with, you know, also piggybacking off of your comment about the patient education, not just the access to physical education that we're teaching them, but the background. I would say everyone on this call probably knows when I say what the word carbohydrate, what that means, right? Um, but then I think, you know, you guys, everyone on here might agree with me that there are, if you've been in an urban setting and you're educating somebody on diabetes management, sometimes I have to explain what a carbohydrate is. And it's definitely not that rare that I have to do that. Um, and that's something that I have to do just even on the floor at CVS when they're buying like a glucose, a rescue glucose dose, like tablets um, that they're going to take to bring their blood sugar up. I have to explain to them what carbohydrates are, why this is important, why there's different types of carbohydrates that everything about diabetes management comes down to regulating carbohydrate intake and insulin use. And they don't even, you know, have, um, they've never had the opportunity to learn what a carbohydrate actually is and how it works. Um, and to be aware of that ahead of time, I think as pharmacists in my, in my field, that's something that kind of gets skipped sometimes in pharmacy school, because we're all talking about things that everyone learned in undergrad, not realizing that our patients didn't go to undergrad, you know, some of them didn't, learn what these basic terms are. And if, uh, if we're not self-aware of those things, uh, then you, you're giving them patient education. Let's say that you get lucky, you give them a patient education resource that maybe it is in the language that they want. Even at that point, did you make sure that they even know um, what the definition is of some of the things that you're teaching them? Thank you ladies for your comments. That, that, that was very, insightful. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. So what we, we're going to discuss are racial disparities in healthcare and what are they? Um, health and healthcare disparities refer to differences in the health outcomes and the health um, care and how it is given to between groups that are closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. Next slide. Um, so I can talk about this. So with the COVID-19 pandemic that Obiyama discussed earlier, um, the pandemic has disproportionately affected minorities as these groups often have uh, less access to care and greater risk of exposure. And with this graph, um, it's from the CDC. It's a study between March 1st and December 5th of 2020. It found that minorities were most likely to be hospitalized due to the COVID-19 pandemic as Hispanics had the highest rate of hospitalizations, um, which is on the left, the left bar. 
And then while non-Hispanic whites had the lowest rate, which is on the right bar, at the, the rightmost one. And then um, if you go to the next slide, uh, with the highest, so yet yeah, with the highest rate of hospitalization among Hispanics and Blacks, they also have a higher percentage of people that have died from COVID-19. Um, so looking at the graph at the bottom, the red bars are the distribution of COVID-19 deaths um, among race and ethnicities. And then the blue bar is the unweighted distribution of population. And if you look at the Hispanic and non-Hispanic Black um, bars, the red bar indicating COVID-19 deaths is nearly double like the number of, pop of people in their population. So even though the minority population has a higher percentage of hospitalizations, their percentages of death due to the virus is also disproportionately higher. And this could be due to health disparities that limit the access and quality of care they receive. And then additionally, with a higher percentage of deaths and hospitalizations, minor minorities also have limited access to the COVID-19 vaccination as explained here by Dr. Bernard, Bernard Ashby. Dr. Bernard Ashby says black people are not getting their fair share of the COVID-19 vaccine. What we're running into now is a lack of access to the vaccine. NBC News reports black Americans have received the vaccine at dramatically lower rates than white Americans. The disparities in the outcomes were predictable, and that's because we are um, under-resourced and, and underappreciated as a population. Dr. Ashby will be part of a virtual panel discussion this evening called The Impact of Systemic Racism on Health and Access to the COVID Vaccine. He explains why he's decided to speak out. Frankly, because I'm tired of it. And, you know, this is an ongoing issue that pre-existed the pandemic and will exist after the pandemic. One solution he feels addresses the problem is providing health care for everyone. If we structured a system that actually was, was more integrated and actually uh, increased access, meaning provided care for everyone in the U.S., uh, that would actually uh, lead to uh, decreased deaths, first of all, but also improve quality of life for our entire country. According to the Center for Disease Control, Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans are dying from COVID at nearly three times the rate of white Americans. Dr. Ashby wants the healthcare system to go after those with less access. We have way too many folks without health care. We have way too many folks who are getting inferior health care. And it really begins with prioritizing our populations and targeting them. I'm Derek Lewis, NBC6 News. Okay, so now we'll turn it over to our panelists. Um, so I know with Ms. Policki, um, you have some background in community health. So I was wondering if you wanted to share any experiences that you um, regarding health disparities. Sure, so um, again, just going back to my community health worker days and, and even today in my role as a health promotion consultant, uh, and what I, what I do see when we survey populations. Um, as a community health worker, the disparities that I saw in terms of, of healthcare, again, we, we go back to access, right? We go back to the idea that um, if, if we just focus on, for example, the location, the geographic location of, of where I work, Southwest Detroit, I worked with a very specific population, predominantly uh, Mexican Americans, uh, Mexicans that um, of immigrant status, many of them who were undocumented um, persons as well. Um, the health disparities came about, again, access. So we had basically one federally qualified health clinic within that given area and given the demand that was that was had by the community the need for the community there was just not enough access to clinicians like people would would need right uh dr duncan brought up the idea um that we have folks who have private insurance and then we have folks that are on government programs and the the majority of the population that goes to a federally qualified healthcare center at the time were folks that had government program insurance. So 
the need is so great in the, in that given population, but there are so very few people that can provide the services necessary um, to that population that it just overtax the system, right? So there just isn't enough to go around for everyone. Not everyone wants to work, like Dr. Duncan said, whether it's a, in, a, in a pharmacy setting in an urban location. Well, the same thing happens when it comes to um, clinicians in primary care, for example, that want to work in those particular locations because of the way insurance plans um, pay back. So, so that in itself creates this huge disparity in, in, in not just access to health, but who goes into particular areas of practice to support the needs of these communities. So that was one of the biggest things that I could see was that the, the need was greater than what we could provide from a clinical standpoint and support. So that, that was a huge issue. And then of course, um, and I think I talked to, to you all as a team before we met was that um, we are not addressing some of the key foundational issues that we're seeing patients present with. So uh, health literacy, and I'm not just talking about knowing how to read um, because we know at least from a health plan perspective too, we try and really focus on creating materials that are written at a sixth grade level, for example, uh, because we know that even though there, there are people that are college graduates, health literacy is a completely different thing from just overall literacy, right? So we wanna make sure that we break down jargon down to a layperson friendly way of communicating with one another so that people can understand. And, and hopefully that in itself will help with reducing some of the health disparities that we do see. But, but also that we have a vast number of people that just are truly illiterate. And I brought up an example that I had with one particular patient when I worked as a community health worker that um, because of the power dynamics that we have within the clinical setting, he was very um, reluctant to let anybody on his clinical team know that he was illiterate, he could not read and he could not write. Uh, he he traveled around his life. He, he, he dealt with things in his life by memory. So like if he had to go somewhere, he began to recognize um, just key markers in the street just to get to places where he needed to go to. But when it came time for, his, uh, for taking his diabetes medication, he was unable to know how to take it because he didn't understand how to read the labels. And it wasn't just that he he couldn't read. He couldn't read them at all. It wasn't a matter of you know take this every twelve hours or take it twice a day. Well, what does that mean? What does twice a day mean for a patient versus just not knowing overall how to read the instructions on his patient education material, and basically just just being the what what I call the bobblehead patient, um, and saying yes to it all. So. Those have been some of my experience with, with health disparities from a community health worker standpoint. Now, in the role that I'm in today as a health promotion consultant working with employers, for example, to help develop well, well-being programs for their employee populations, is that we are often, um, we often take the approach of telling people, well, here are the things you need to do to get healthy. And it's something like, well, better nutrition, um, more physical activity and less sedentary behaviors, um, go and get your preventive physicals, things like that. But we're not really addressing what are the fundamental barriers that someone may have that is keeping them from practicing those healthy habits that we're trying to get them to, to do. So for example, uh, let's use the DASH diet for just as an example, which I, I, I'm going to assume that most of you are familiar with. Many people don't have access to healthy foods, right? Even when they're working. So we're talking about the working poor. That's a conversation that we've had oftentimes with some of our employers. And it's that we do have the working poor, people that are working 
at a minimum wage job, they do have insurance, but yet they have, they're living paycheck to paycheck. And we see this often. This is one of the primary concerns that we're seeing now in workplace settings is that folks are living paycheck to paycheck. So they're financially insecure. Um, they're one step away from maybe losing their homes or not paying their utilities because they're, they're just, they don't have savings. So um, this creates a health disparity in, in its own because like Dr. Duncan brought up before, it's a matter of priorities sometimes that we are not aware of as, as clinicians or as health promotion consultants uh, or what have you. So our, our response is, well, the patient's being non-compliant when we don't really know why the patient is not adhering to, to some of the, the, you know, the suggestions or recommendations that we're making because we just don't know what other issues are, um, are being dealt with by that particular patient. So I'm not sure if that's answering the question fully, but those are some of my experiences with health disparities is that um, we, we just don't know what the patient is, is, is dealing with and we're unable due to that lack of, of knowledge to support them where they really need the support. So if that kind of helps address that question. Yeah, um, when we met with you, you shared us like with us your story. So yeah, I like that. And then uh, Dr. Duncan, did you have anything you wanted to add from your experiences at the pharmacy? Yeah, I would say, so uh, right now we're at a unique point in time uh, where we have one of the most obvious healthcare disparities as the, the last video just told us was the COVID-19, COVID not just the vaccination and access to vaccination, but how much that it's definitely uh, attacking the entire world, but particularly um, greater risk of death among minorities uh, from COVID-19. So we actually have raw data happening today to say that we still have systemic issues in terms of access to healthcare um, and that people are at more risk for dying just because they're black or Hispanic or you know, basically not white. Um, and so for me working at CVS, I right now, so at my old store, we did uh, COVID vaccination, uh, COVID testing, not vaccination. We did the COVID nasal swabs, right? Um, and we, when we received that at first, when we were getting all the people that were uh, applying like to come in and get the nasal swab, it, you would be surprised at how much of the white community was coming to get tested sometimes multiple times in a week that we're seeing the same patients. Um, but data from CVS was showing that the, the, we were not testing as many uh, black, um, black, the black community, yet the black community is being attacked or the Hispanic community is being attacked more than the white community on that. Um, so now when we're seeing the vaccinations, like he, uh, the last doctor on the video was saying, uh, now we're having an issue with getting access to the vaccination. And so from a healthcare point, standpoint, while I'm watching him speak, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so first we don't have transportation to even get to healthcare if they even have healthcare. Um, and so, I, you know, piggybacking too on like the last uh, discussion that uh, Corrine was talking about is uh, that the people, so first we have the issue of just getting to the healthcare facility, but then we have the working poor that she's talking about. People that have healthcare doesn't necessarily mean access to healthcare because sometimes they're in a high deductible plan or do they have the access to actually get to the doctor's appointments? Is it an in-network doctor? Um, can they afford the in-network doctor? Is there available appointments at the in-network doctor? Or are we gonna charge them more to go to a doctor that's outside availability? There are so many more steps to actually getting the true access to healthcare than just having health insurance. Um, even with Medicaid, we see something called the spin down. I don't know if anybody's been, uh, you know, aware of what a spin down was, but when I was a, a pharmacy student, I had Medicaid and I had a spin down and it was almost impossible for me to still get access to healthcare because of how difficult it was for me to overcome a spin down. A spin down is where you have to spend a certain amount of money um, on healthcare services or prescriptions or something like that in a month before your Medicaid becomes active for one month. So if I didn't spend $370 in a month 
out of my own pocket. My Medicaid basically wasn't active. And so, yeah, it was great if I got into a car accident or if I had cancer, that would be great that I have that Medicaid and I'm not going to walk away with hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical debt because my Medicaid would become active. Um, but if, if not, if I just need to go to the doctor for a cholesterol screening or a COVID vaccination, if it, you know, it wasn't covered by the government or something like that, it would still be difficult for me to get there. And mind you, you know, I'm a full-time student. I'm in a city that I don't live in, so I don't have family there. Um, and this is just my own personal one person's experience. You know, that my difficulties don't represent all of the difficulties that people would have in the Medicaid plan with a spin down. That's something that people don't talk about or maybe aren't aware of if they haven't had to go through it. You know, if I didn't sit here and explain to you what a spin down was with Medicaid and you've never had Medicaid and you become a pharmacist in three years, you have no idea that your patient has to go through all of these hoops just to come get a prescription from you and have it be affordable for them. Uh, people think of access to healthcare as, do we have healthcare? Um, yeah, do you have a health insurance? Yes, but can you actively use your health insurance? Is it really allowing you to go to the doctor, get your teeth cleaned every six months? Are you really getting the same fair advantage that someone would have on say a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan that is you know, private insurance, fully paid, low deductible, that access to healthcare might look differently than someone on a Medicaid plan with a spin down. And the, the hard part about that is that those people are working. So they're at work, they're making money and now they in some of their minds are feeling punished by the fact that they have an income because it's still making it harder for them to even get Medicaid. Um, and so I say my experience with health disparities starts with that access to health care um, and how difficult even once you start obtaining health care, uh, is that health care really truly usable? Are you using it when you need on your daily life? And those are things that we don't stop and learn about. Where is the point in contact for the average American person uh, who goes out and votes for the politicians that make up the rules that determine where the money for Medicaid go? The people that are going out and voting for those people, are they aware of what that really looks like? And are we really truly helping get access to healthcare or are we just putting it on paper that they have health insurance and in the event of emergency, they're covered? Thank you. Um, so to be mindful of time, I'm gonna hand it over to Obiyama to talk about what we can do next. Course I have to unmute myself first. Thank you very much, Lane. So now let's talk about what do we do next. Systemic racism has been in existence for way too long. A study carried out in 1999 on how to calculate the creatine clearance had a correction. So recently, a medical student in the University of Washington, Naomi Nkinshi, fought for two years to take away the uh, take out the race out of the equation, so that conversion factor. And guess what? She won. So the University of Washington had to um, take out to see that whenever the creatine clearance is being calculated, they will take out the um, correction factor. So when they were asked, I mean, University of Washington, why do you do? Why did you uh, come up with this new policy? They they replied that this change was made because the use of race in the biomedical environment is an ineffective variable and does not meet the scientific rigor that we expect of our diagnostic tool. So with this, I'll ask uh, Ms. Karen, how do you, um, what can we do to address systemic racism and racial disparities in healthcare? So that's a big question. That's a big question. So I, I don't want to sound cliche, uh, but I think one of the ways that we can work as professionals um, and just as individuals to impact uh, and reduce health disparities is by being an advocate. I think it's, it's really important that as we are doing whatever it is that we're doing, we really look at how can we advocate for individuals that don't have um, the advocacy power themselves, right? To understand how we can have power in allyship. That's really important. How do we 
align with the needs of, of populations just from a human perspective and how do we use that agency to influence, particularly as it relates to, for example, what you're doing here today, curriculum development, right? There's a lot of conversation around uh, not only in the pharmacy field, but other areas of, of clinical uh, and areas of healthcare that we need more cultural competency training. We need a better understanding uh, as to what diversity, equity, inclusion, what do they really mean? And that's, that's foundational to these conversations because if we don't understand the needs of these populations, if we don't understand what equity really means, right? Equity is not equality. Equity has a completely different meaning. If we don't know what those are, um, then we would have a really hard time advocating for, for change. Um, and there are ways to do that. We can influence uh, these changes. I also wanna talk about what uh, Dr. Duncan kind of led us in this conversa conversation about, and it's that idea of, of mentorship and development of pipelines. How do we create pipelines and mentorships? Not necessarily in maybe not in the pharmacy field, but how do we create mentorships and pipelines in other key areas of education? So I, I always encourage people to think about that, to be a mentor to someone else, regardless of which discipline you are in, because that can, that can make a huge difference. And then I think you, as, as students, and I consider myself a lifelong learner in, in, in life, uh, that we all have an opportunity to be influencers some, in some way, shape, or form. Keep these conversations going, even amongst yourselves, um, and be really introspective. Like, take time to um, identify your blind spots as you're going through your studies. Immerse yourself uh, whenever possible, in, and go visit different neighborhoods. Really immerse yourself in opportunities that get you to look at things from different perspectives, right? So for example, if you live, you're, you're at Wayne State, um, take some interest in learning about maybe the history of, of the area, right? Uh, one great example and something that I've done before is giving people a tour of the Delray neighborhood in Southwest Detroit. Many people are very unfamiliar with that particular neighborhood, but sometimes going into, into these very specific neighborhoods gives you a glimpse, even if it's just a minor visual, and then take that curiosity and, and run with it. Um, I think it's a lot like language. You can't fully learn a language until you immerse yourself in it. So think of it in that way, because that can drive how you um, advocate for changes and you get to understand the needs of specific population. So I would say as a professional, lead with curiosity, ask questions, even when they're tough questions. And most importantly, ask those tough questions of yourself, right? We didn't really go into a lot of discussion around diversity, equity, inclusion. We didn't, we didn't unfortunately, we could, we could probably spend hours having these conversations, um, but around social determinants of health. What are, what are they? What are risk factors? Um, but really ask yourselves um, about your own blind spots. How are they keeping you? How are they creating barriers and how you are going to um, address health disparities once you go out into your fields and really work directly with your, with your patient populations, with your communities? and know and always take a collective approach. I try to do that whenever possible. I rely on so many different partners in, in both the community, at my job and everything else that I do because I am not an expert. I, I don't know that I'll ever get to be an expert, but I rely on my community of, of other professionals to really help me understand um, how to impact health disparities and what I can do to address them. Thank you very much. As a matter of fact, your response just hit all my last questions. I was going to ask, 
uh, how can healthcare professionals make an impact and also how students can make an impact. And you've already touched on those two things. And uh, Dr. Duncan, do you have anything to add to those uh, things? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, I think the first thing is awareness. I definitely 100% agree with Karina on everything that she said. The biggest thing, um, awareness and introspection. Those are the two words that she said that I think are huge. The first thing is everyone here needs to accept that this is an issue. This is not up for debate. Um, politicians like to pretend that it is. Um, people in power like to pretend that this is debatable. It's not. People that are not white are more likely to die from healthcare issues. That's just the way that it is. These are facts, not opinions. So the first thing is that everyone here accept that and then take that mindset and take it to your communities, your friends, uh, people that aren't going to be pharmacists, people that are just going to be in healthcare in general, make that a priority um, and something that we don't just tiptoe around because some people are so afraid of offending others or looking, um, you know, putting their foot in their mouth that they never have those awkward conversations and don't make the comments um, that are necess like necessary to keep these very relevant. We're at a time right now where, you know, COVID-19 is, is something I personally haven't seen in my lifetime, a pandemic. Um, and it's, attacking non-whites more than, than the white population. So it's a good time to have these conversations about vaccinations, about access to healthcare, um, making sure that you know we realize that there's an issue. Uh, the next thing is getting the mindset of the doctor in the video and say, frankly, because I'm tired of it, that's why I care because I'm tired of it. And you don't have to be black or Latino to care. I need, it has to be white people have to care. Because right now, the majority of the people that make the decisions that create change, um, the majority of them are white. And so if white people don't start caring um, about this systemic racism and this issue and health care disparities, there's not going to be change easily made because they are the people making the change. They're the people that are the lawmakers. They are the people that decide where all of these things go. Um, also, you know, in the conversation chat, someone brought up the Tuskegee experiment. Hopefully everyone knows what that is in this, this chat. And, you know, unfortunately we didn't get a chance to really talk or go into that, but that literally shapes almost 90% of this conversation and that it is a lack of trust in the healthcare community. So once we get people the access to healthcare, are they even trusting the people that are telling them what to do? Do they really want um, you know, we get them to the doctor's office, we get them health care, um, we get the transportation, we get the things paid for, um, and then the doctor in front of them doesn't look and talk like them. And, you know, the Tuskegee experiment only stopped in the 70s. My mom was born in the 70s. So we have people that are alive, our elderly population that lived through this. This is not 1800s. This is relevant to them. They literally read about this on the news. They saw, you know, President Clinton go on there and say, hey, the CDC led you wrong. And now we wanted to go and tell them the CDC says, get a shot. You know, take that mindset and say, that's frustrating. That's, that's hard to overcome. That in the same lifetime, you saw the American government actively paying a part and in increasing the death of black people right in their face. Um, and then they turn around 30 years later, 40 years later and say, you really need a COVID vaccine. I don't blame people for being concerned about getting that, that vaccination, but what can we do to make sure that they know things have changed? There are more laws, there are more ethics involved there, you know, and make them feel like an, like you are an advocate, like, you know, Kareen said, be an advocate um, for the change that we want to see and be involved in that. I think that that's the biggest thing is walk away from this with the same mindset of frankly, because I'm tired of it. And that will really shape a lot of things. I love that he said that. I love that we all got a chance to talk about that and say, you know, we there has to be change. And if if you go into the communities and, you know, like Kareen was saying, go into communities that you're not normally exposed to. That doesn't mean go and drive through the neighborhood. That means volunteer at um, a shelter, volunteer at a food drive, volunteer. You need volunteer hours if you're in school. Um, you know, contact me if you'd like. I'll leave my contact information and I can put you into contact with different um, organizations throughout the Detroit community that you could get involved in and get exposed and go with an open mind. Understand that there are biases out there. You definitely might have a bias it, and be able to be willing to, to change that bias, to try and work against it every day, every interaction um, and get your family and friends to be aware of the issue and also be tired of it. 
even if it doesn't personally affect them. I think if everyone did that, then, you know, the, the need for change would feel more urgent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This has been very insightful. I wish we had more time. We could talk more about this. So at this point, I'll hand this over to Brooke. Just with respect to time, I just wanted to thank our panelists for coming and sharing their time and insight with us. I also wanted to thank our P1 committee for all their hard work, as well as everyone who joined on just to listen about these issues and just to be more involved and learn more. And I know most of us have class after this, so if anybody has any questions, we'll hang back for a few minutes. And with their permission, I'll release their contact information so that you can get in contact with them if you have any more. But thank you and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you everyone that attended and thank you for our speakers um, and your insights. Also, I'd like to thank Dr. David Pitts and Dr. Commissaris and Dr. Mary Beth O'Connell and Dr. Joseph um, is it Nardo, Do, Do, Nardoli? Nardolilo. Nardolilo. Yes. Nardolilo. That's Nardolilo. Your I know you got it. I wanted to thank him. Um, You're sandable. Everybody. everybody does it. Thank you. 